The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. What are tool activities and why does Lawrence call them tool activities? This should be an easy question if you're doing any reading. What does he mean by tool activities? I know some of you know. You know? You don't remember? I guess you were doing homework instead of reading. <laughs> All right, tool activities mean multi-purpose actions. They're instinctive action patterns. They do have a motivational component, so they're classified as fixed action patterns rather than reflexes. But they refer to multi-purpose actions that the very same, they're components of many different fixed action patterns. But they're also fixed action patterns of their own, like locomotion. You know, we use locomotion as part of the appetitive behavior behind any, almost very many other fixed action patterns. And the same is true of uh, orienting movements. We'd make orienting movements in response to stimuli, it's true. And that makes them seem like reflexes, but in fact, they're part of many fixed action patterns. And we don't just sit without even stimuli. You know, even if none of you are moving, and I'm, I don't just stare at one's place, my eyes are always roaming around. I'm making orienting movements. Grasping with the hands is the same. So each of these major types of activities are tool activities and there's actually many varieties of each one. Where locomotion is easiest to talk about there because we define the various gates, especially in four-legged animal, but humans still have various types of walking and running, various speeds of running. Okay, now what about the action-specific potential behind these and other fixed action patterns. We know that if they're like most fixed action patterns, the, the action specific potential, meaning the level of motivation, builds up over time. Well, it doesn't build up at the same rate for different fixed action patterns. It tends to build up at a rate proportional to how often the pattern, the, the movement is needed. And we know that many of these fixed action patterns, like predatory behavior in the cat, are actually a series of fixed, they're inherited as a, thing, as a series of different fixed action patterns, but they become linked during development. That is, habits form, depending on the experience of the animal, usually with the mother, in the case of predatory cats, uh, and the, the various patterns become linked. So then they're normally doing them, the searching, locomotion and searching, then stalking, then pouncing, and then the killing bite, usually in that order. So how frequently does the cat perform each of these behaviors? Well, they perform stalking a lot more than they pounce because they have to stalk, they have to search for prey the most before they find any. So they're going to spend the most time doing that. 
And then when they see them, they have to stalk them. And they're going to do that a lot more than they will actually pump because they don't get the opportunity to pump that often. Okay, the animals move away. The animals smell them and run away and so forth. And, of course, the, the killing bite is executed the least frequently. Because sometimes when they pounce on an animal, the animal still escapes. When we talk about escape behavior, you'll see examples of that on videos. So that's the action that's done the least. Well, that means that the action-specific potential, the motivation to do those different things, building up at a different rate, they're much more motivated to do searching locomotion than they are those other things, because they have to do it the most. We'll come back to this. But for those frequently used action patterns, the uh, thresholds can be lowered quite frequently. Take, for example, uh, flying in a little rent, say, and compare it to flying in a goose. You know, that little wren can't stop for more than a few seconds before he's flying again. They they flit around very frequently. Whereas the goose, once he flies, I don't want to mute it. I just want to turn the amplitude down, but this isn't. There we go. Okay, so the goose, when he flies, he won't fly again for quite a while, unless a stimulus like a predator, you know, causes a rapid rise in the motivation to fly. But in most cases, uh, if he's not being disturbed by predators, he won't fly again for quite a while, whereas the wren is flying much more. So the, the rate of buildup is different from species to species for the very same action pattern, and it's different for the different fixed action patterns in the same species. Let's talk about the threshold for this responding to stimuli that elicit a fixed action pattern. As the motivation builds up, the threshold, the amount of stimulation needed to get the action pattern that uh, goes down. Look at hunger and feeding. We've mentioned this before, and it's obvious when you think about it, it went the hungrier the animal or person is, the less discriminating he is. Why do we have dessert at the end of a meal? We're not as hungry. So it's often the most palatable thing. And of course, there are exceptions, but most of us like sweet things. And some countries don't even serve dessert. Like in China, it's an American habit. Okay, but of course it occurs in, ma in many countries that have it. The dessert is last because it's the most palatable thing, and uh, they they will still eat dessert even though they're not hungry for food and other foods anymore. And as I mentioned, if you have a child that's very finicky, that's because he's so well fed. Much less finicky if he's hungry. And if you don't like certain and start something and all your friends do like it, well, just don't eat for a while. If you want to start liking it. And then you'll get used to it. I thought I'd never like beer. I hated beer when I was a kid. Brother would be drinking beer. Couldn't ah, stand the stuff. But then, on a real hot day, you get really thirsty, and your, must, your thresholds are lowered, okay? Your thresholds for drinking. And so, you like it a little better. And then I got used to it, now I can drink beer. 
Still don't like it as well as some people do. Okay. Breeding, sexual attraction, really obvious. A horse breeder, if he wants his mare, if he, he's got a stallion, let's say, and he's wants to breed that stallion, if the stallion is worth a lot, he gets money for that. But if he's being paid, that stallion has to perform. So what does he do? He, do, he does not let that stallion copulate for a long period of time. So he, the motivation to breed builds up in the animal. And if you build it up enough, I mean, he'll breed with a mule. That's how you get donkeys. <laughs> and, and so that's important. And it happens in humans, too. There's a, an amusing story there in the Lawrence reading about story told to Lawrence by a, uh, a ship captain he knew and how he felt after being at sea for a long time. He came back and he said, every woman in town looks like Helen of Troy. But after I'd been here a couple of weeks, he said, so many ugly ones. What's happened? Threshold lowering. Okay. So, and this really explains to a large degree the phenomenon we call in vacuo reaction, vacuum activity, another term used in ethology. It literally means when an instinctive behavior pattern that occurs without any stimulus. That would, that would be the literal meaning of vacuum activity. But in fact, in fact, it seems to be a case of extreme threshold lowering. The thresholds can get so low that we don't even notice the stimuli the animals are responding to. And Lawrence talks about his, when he was young, he had a pet starling. And uh, he could be eating dinner with his family and uh, that he would notice that the starling seemed to be catching and feeding on flies up near the ceiling. And he couldn't see the flies. So he tried getting a ladder and going up there to see if there were any flies. And he convinced himself that there were none. You know, and yet the starling was there showing the fixed action pattern of searching for, catching, and, and eating the flies. So that's called in vacuo activity or reactions. Uh, some of you that, if you keep rats uh, or mice in cages and they don't have any nesting material, they have a motivation to nest. And if they're deprived of nesting material for a long period of time, they'll try to build a nest with their own tail. You know, and canaries will do build nests with their own feathers. And uh, mallard drakes, when they're in a, they're highly motivated uh, to mate, they're also very aggressive against other males, and they, uh, they'll actually attack their own tails because the thresholds are so low. It doesn't take much of a stimulus. You know, they just need certain key stimuli. And if thresholds are low enough, their own tail will be enough to elicit the behavior. Ostriches, deprived of their usual method of feeding of grass, they will pluck grass that is not, a, not even there. The same true is, you will notice this in rodents, if you don't, you know, we give them rod, uh, rat pellets, we call them. Well, why do we give them food that's so hard? In fact, it's mixed with material that grinds their teeth down. Well, they have to, because in the case of rodents, the teeth keep growing, these incisor teeth on both bottom and top. Same is true of hamsters and mice. It, they just keep growing. So they're highly motivated to gnaw, and if you deprive them of things to gnaw on, let's say, say you're feeding them wet mash or something, they can't wear their teeth down. They will chew on the, on the metal cage. You know, they'll chew on anything they can get their teeth around. 
reminds me of some dogs. <laughs> I, I don't know what their fixed action patterns, how much of it's nesting or whatever, but some dogs also can mess up your house quite a bit because of what they do to, to shoes, blankets, and so forth. So with a lot of threshold lowering, you, all, all you need is a very small stimulus. It's, it's almost like an internal reservoir, uh, that is sort of a metaphor for the, the action-specific potential, it builds up to a point it just starts spilling over. Now, we talked last time about the different components of fixed action patterns, and we'll use these terms a lot. Uh, there was a component that wasn't defined for a long time until this guy, Wallace Craig, uh, defined it. It corresponds to the level of uh, the action-specific potential, but before they even used that theoretical term, this behavior had been described. What is it? What did Craig talk about? Appetitive behavior. It's usually the appetit appetitive behavior of some sort, usually locomotion and searching behavior and orienting, is, has the lowest threshold. So when an animal gets hungry, he, the, the action, the, the, the movement that's part of the, the series of actions that compose a fixed action pattern, the part with the lowest threshold is appetitive behavior, searching behavior. So they literally search for the stimulus that will lead to the rest of the behavior. And finding appetitive behavior for some Fixed action patterns, especially in humans, has been led to quite a bit of controversy. And the controversy that Lawrence got into concerned what he called an appetite for aggression. For example, the second one, the gray lag gander. You know, when he's in an aggressive mood, because he's in the mating mood, uh, he literally looks for other ganders to fight with, okay? And there's other, many, many animals that are like this. And so he applied this to humans. He said, think of the young men roam the streets looking for trouble. What are they doing? It's the same thing. They have a motivation to get into fights. Maybe, maybe our aggressive video games are able to satisfy that urge for most of a, a lot of young men. But if you look at the aggressive video games and see who plays them, you'll see it's much more male than female, so there are girls that do it too. And uh, young men that seem to have no real desire to fight at all can get extremely involved in these games, and they can feel great triumph when they win. I remember when my son was uh, growing up, uh, this was long before he came to MIT, uh, he went to the MIT camp and the counselor found out that all the young men in his group uh, were mostly middle school age. They loved this particular video game that he also played. It's like many, many MIT students. So he organized the tournament. And the kids got so involved in it, you know. And my son, I could tell he's not aggressive, but he felt great triumph when he beat the counselor in, in the first part of the tournament. Of course, they continued the tournament, and the counselor beat him the second time. But you could tell that he had that a drive. That was this all happened after Lawrence, of course, had done his studies. I don't know what he would say about. <laughs> the motivation behind doing these video games, but I'm sure what I'm saying is some part of the explanation. There were many experiments done with jewel fish because of their fighting behavior, and one, in one of the experiments, male Jewish jewel fish that wanted to fight, he would could teach them a maze when the only reward was getting a, a visual view of another jewel, a male Jewish jewel fish. 
Also, in the fighting, they change coloration when they're in that uh, mood. And uh, just seeing the other male and being able to <laughs> attack the glass. See, they, they didn't actually fight. You didn't need to get them to fight to, to get that reward. And so it might seem strange to you, but being hungry can is necessary to be rewarded by food. So actually, we like to be hungry. It's not too hungry, okay? Because without being hungry, food isn't rewarding. And it's the same for the aggressive drive. So I just discussed briefly here the reactions people have had against that. Remember, for a long time, uh, especially in America and in Russia, there was a pretty strong bias that against any behavior that couldn't be explained in terms of a stimulus response model. You know, people come to believe that a certain model is adequate to explain all behavior. They don't like it when there's some behavior that can't be explained. So they're going to try to find some way to explain it away. And uh, so how could there be an appetite for aggression? It, has, it must be a stimulus one. And yes, there's all, they're always responding to some stimuli, but the stimulus can be minimal, and the thresholds can change drastically due to an internal state that's changing. And of course, we know there was a bias against instinctive behavior in general, especially in humans, but not only in humans. They, I, I read studies in, written in the 30s, especially uh, before World War II, where people, experimenters went to great lengths to try to prove that some behavior that appeared seemed to be innate because it appeared in very early uh, was actually learned in utero. It was believed that, for example, the the birds that have to peck their way out of an egg they actually learned to do that in the uterus or in the egg before they were before they hatched. And they went to great lengths to show that there could be such experience. Now people are, are not quite so extreme. Although there are still people in the humanities and, and even in sociology that believe that all that unlearned behavior is not important in explaining human behavior. So let's go back to this topic of internal readiness, the action-specific potential, and how it varies, just to give some examples. I mentioned how flying builds up at different rates and different birds. Uh, but take the example, uh, I think this is described in the Lawrence chapter, uh, from Paul Lehausen's studies of cats. Lehausen studied a number of different species of cats, uh, found the same fixed action patterns with slight variations, of course, in different species of cat, including the very large Asian and African cats and domestic cats in America and Europe. Uh, and if you have a cat that's a hunter, that is, he's been exposed to hunting when he was, he's watched his mother hunt, he will become a hunter. Okay, and you, he's deprived of hunting for a long period. What does that cat do if you put him in a room full of mice? Well, he'll, he will initially attack and kill a few of those mice. Then what does he do? Does he just stop? No. He continues to stalk and pounce on mice, but he stops executing the killing bite. He will jump on them and swat them with his paws, and it looks like he's playing with them. And then eventually he will stalk them, but he won't even pounce. And then eventually he will just, he appears to be searching for them, He's very alert, he pricks up his ears, he's watching them, he's showing all the orienting movements of a searching cat. But now he's not doing any of those things. And eventually, of course, he'll go to sleep. So that's because the 
the rate at which the action specific potential behind each of those fixed action patterns that have been combined in attack behavior of the cat builds up at a different rate, depending on how frequently it's needed in natural life of these animals. Can you answer this question for me? Is it true that cats or dogs hunt only in order to eat? And describe an experiment to test that idea. Do they hunt only in order to eat? Does a cat that's a ratter, and we know he hunts for rats and mice, does he do that just in order to eat? Does he do it because he's hungry? Well, for one thing, how can that be? Uh, people that keep pet cats are feeding them. They feed them every day. These are not hungry cats. Well, do they just go out near feeding time? No. Well, how can you prove that the motivation to eat and the motivation to hunt are quite separate? Well, you can get that and deprive the cat of, ability, of opportunities to hunt. So his eagerness to hunt builds up. Okay, and now we put him in a situation where he has to say, cross over a dish of tuna fish, his favorite food, just in order to get out and hunt. What does he do? Does he run to the tuna fish? No, he'll leap right over it to get out there and hunt. And that's been seen in brain stimulation studies where you can stimulate the mood that causes them to be to go into a hunting mood. They'll leap over dishes, everything, just to get at a mouse or a rat. Because the motivation to hunt is quite separate. So it's pretty easy to do an experiment to show that, and it has certainly been done. And similarly, we can talk about species that they don't they don't hunt and kill in the same way that the cats do, but they still hunt uh, for insects like Lawrence's starlings. Uh, those starlings normally, when they feed, they are poking their bills into the bark of trees or in leaves, and they're poking, using their bills to poke. Well, if you feed the, it's a pet starling, and you're feeding him all the time, so he's not hungry. That animal will feed in order to poke, whereas the normal sequence would be poking in order to get food. But now he will, he will feed just to be able to poke. The cactus uh, finch on the Galapagos is a very interesting bird. Here, here you see the, the, a finch, and it looks like he's got this long extension of his beak. It's, what it is is a, a cactus thorn that the, the bird has found, and he uses that, and all cactus finches do this. They get that thorn, and they use that to poke deeper into crevices in the cactus and other places in order to get food. And if you deprive that cactus finch, of opportunity to use the thorn that way, they will, they're highly motivated to do that. Okay, and even if he's well fed, he will take the, he will search for the thorn, take the thorn, and he'll be out poking. Okay, because it's a separate motivation. Okay, now I want to talk specifically about the sensory side of these innate behavior patterns. We call the mechanism on that side the innate releasing mechanism. That was a theoretical term introduced by ethologists who did not actually study the nervous system. Okay, but they knew there was an innate releasing mechanism. I've seen this statement, and I want you to criticize it. 
The innate releasing mechanism responds to complex stimulus configurations and triggers the behavioral response from the organism. Sort of a definition of innate behavior in some people's view. But what's wrong with it? There's a couple of glaring things wrong with it. First of all, these innate releasing mechanisms are at least at the onset, when the animal is young, are not responding to complex stimulus configurations. They're responding to very simple stimuli. And if the response is, say, of the young to the mother, he doesn't respond to her as, a, as an individual. He responds to specific stimuli presented by that mother, like the herring gulps responding to the orange spot on the mother's beak. And an orange spot on a pencil will elicit the same kind of gaping behavior for feeding. So the stimulus is generally very simple, and they can be multiple, but they're very simple stimuli. So that's the first thing that's wrong with it. And now I, what about the, the I say elicits the behavior, as if we're talking about a reflex. But we're not talking about reflexes. The response will not occur if the motivation level isn't high, that action specific potential, okay? So there's no inevitable elicitation of these fixed action patterns, the fixed motor component, the fixed motor pattern component of the fixed action pattern. That's what's wrong with the statement. We're not dealing with reflexes. So let's just give examples of the simplicity of the key stimuli. We talked about the I just mentioned the herring gull chicks. Uh, you remember the stickleback fish. Very simple stimuli in the female that the male responds to in order to initiate his specific actions in leading the female to his nest in order to get her to lay eggs in it. They're not complex stimuli. Just very simple shapes that are resembled in some way a fish with a swollen belly. They don't even have to look much, much like fish to us. Lawrence mentions the, uh, the stinging response of the female common tick. This was an example he got from Jakob von Uxkul in 1909. Uh, very simple stimuli elicit that stinging response of the tick. A body temperature of about 37 degrees and the smell of butyric acid. That's all it takes. And uh, we know that the tick can fall from a bush onto an animal. And uh, we don't think the tick is detecting surface temperatures at a distance, it probably responds to the odor of animal passing, but then the animal bumps the bush and so forth, and the ticks fall onto them. The stinging response, though, is triggered by those two stimuli that I mentioned, surface temperature plus the odor. You can see the size of it. This is the tip of a ballpoint pen. This is a tick from a dog. And here are some deer ticks, which are a little smaller, known for spreading diseases like Lyme's disease. It's spread by deer ticks. Okay. So the other, he talks about the common cricket female's response to courting males. She's responding to the specific pitch of the male courtship song. And different species of cricket have slightly different pitches of sound. So females of their own species will respond just if the pitch is right. And that's there's something very similar in mosquitoes. The male responds to specific frequencies of the female's wing beats. That buzzing sound we hear when we hear a female flying around. That's a very meaningful stimulus for the the male uh looking for a female to mate with. So the stimuli are, are very simple. Let's talk about the contribution of Jerry Leffin here at MIT. 
he died just a couple of years ago, uh, but that was long after his retirement from MIT. Uh, back in the 1959, he published a paper that one of the most highly cited papers in neuroscience, and the title was pretty far out, What the Frog's Eye Tells the Frog's Brain. And uh, it's a very scholarly paper that reports uh, systematically the experiments that he did with Machirana, a South American scientist, Warren McCulloch, and uh, Pitts, who was another MIT scientist and engineer, actually. And this is what they were studying. They were studying, basically, they were inspired by the behavior of the frog. This frog is responding to the visual stimulus of that bug on the leaf. The bug was flying, landed on the leaf, the frog waited. He might have made an orienting movement towards that bug, and then he simply waits until the bug is still. And then out comes his tongue. It's sticky on the end. Uh, and they're, normally they're pretty accurate. They only flip their tongue out when the, they're close enough to the uh, the bug. Okay, so what Lethen did, he is recording electrically. He used tiny electrodes in the frog's brain. Sometimes he did it just from the stump of the optic nerve because he was really recording from the axons coming from the retina. So it was the activity of retinal ganglion. So this was the information that reached the midbrain tectum, the roof of the midbrain where orienting movements are, re, re, are caused. And only after the animal orients and brings it to a, the stimulus to a certain part of the tectum that then you get the uh, tongue flick response. So he was recording from the terminal arbors of axons coming from the retina. There was argument about that for a while, but he knew when he wrote that paper what he must be recording from, because he had recorded even from axons in the nerve. And he showed four, actually there were five types of, of axons, but four major ones that he described in great detail. The one that's the most well-known we call bug detectors. He didn't call it that in the paper. He called them net convexity detectors. But he did in his discussion, uh, his discussion with these other scientists, he did talk about that what he had given was sort of a, a detailed scientific description of a bug, the kind of stimulus that the bug presented to the frog. They, those accents were part of what we call an innate releasing mechanism for detecting and orienting towards prey. He found another major type that has an easily uh, discerned function was he called a, a dimming detector. And it's interesting that the dimming detectors were uh, the activity of much larger axons, very the most rapidly conducting axon in the optic nerve. And that's interesting because these are responding to sudden dimming of the field of the sort that occurs when there's an approaching predator. And so the frog responds in a completely different way. And note that it's very fast. The speed is always at a premium when it concerns escape from predators. So the fastest conducting ones were responding to the dimming, which would be a visual stimulus indicating the uh, very likely indicating a predator. Okay, now because the key stimuli are so simple, you can get very maladaptive responses in some cases, and these are a couple that he describes. First of all, turkey chicks, I'll say a little more about turkey chicks' responses to predators, but 
First, what Lawrence says, they respond the very same way to a fat fly crawling across the ceiling as they do to a hawk flying overhead. They don't discriminate. So they make maladaptive escape responses. And he says that young kestrels have an innate response to water. They'll make bathing movements, but they'll do the same thing. Just to, They'll respond to the stimuli from a marble tabletop because of the glassy surface. And that's the only stimulus needed to elicit the bathing response. Though obviously not very adaptive. These are just uh, showing older kestrel. There's the turkey baby. Now, a little more about that. This is an experiment done uh, not too long ago, 2001, in the journal Behavior, where some nice experiments were done on turkey chicks. Why did they use the, this particular turkey chick? Because it was born, uh, it was hatched from slightly below ground, and the ground warms up, and the egg hack hatches. No parents around. They just hatch, and the eggs are deposited separately, so there's no siblings around either. So they're not exposed to any social cues that could teach them anything about predators. So if they're going to be able to escape from predators when they're first hatched, you know, the response has to be innate. And that's why they picked this little chick. Uh, they live solitarily, of course, except when they need to mate. They kept them in a large outdoor aviary set in a natural rainforest habitat, similar to where they would normally be found. Now, in these graphs, each black bar shows the amount of a certain kind of behavior they saw. Uh, in, in this case, running behavior. Okay, so the animal is running in response to the stimuli listed here. The first bars there are response to a live cat walking through the, the aviary. The second one to a live dog. The third one to a snake model. Okay, they didn't use a live snake, but they had a model of a snake. Okay, and as you know, models of snakes can look exactly like a snake. Okay, those are the three stimuli that cause the most running. The stimuli that corresponded to a model of a raptor, so it was a hawk model, looked like a hawk shape gliding overhead, didn't cause the running. What it, did, what it did cause was the second response here, crouching. More crouching in response to that overhead stimulus than anything, than, than in any of the other stimuli. A little more to cats than to dogs, but mostly to the raptors. But now notice another thing. Oh, this, this one here, uh, when they, they suddenly appear very vigilant with their head up and they search mostly with their eyes, that response was elicited most by recordings, not of turkey sounds, but of alarm calls of songbirds that live in that forest, indicating that these birds, almost as soon as they're hatched, respond to those alarm calls. Not to turkey calls, but to alarm calls of other birds that live in the same place. And they're responding mostly by that vigilance behavior. What they're looking for, of course, is predators. But now, there's a black bar and a white bar. The black bar is to their the live cat and mouse, or their realistic model. The white bars are the response to control stimuli. The control stimuli were, in the case of the cat, dog, and uh, and uh, raptor, they're just cardboard boxes. They colored the cardboard boxes, so they were they controlled for the color, but not detail for shape. And you can see they're usually responding the same way to the boxes. In the case of the snake, they used the, just a simple cardboard cylinder. That 
it was very effective. But there were exceptions to that. In other words, the only thing about this one that made it a raptor was that it was up here. And it was about the right speed of movement and the right size. That's all that was required. But notice here, this is the recordings of sound. Here, there was a significant difference between the experimental sounds, the recording of the actual alarm call, and just white noise, because white noise was the control here. Okay, so there they had a specific response, specific differences. And perhaps in the case of the raptor, uh, there, as I mentioned once before in the class, there is some evidence that they, uh, they have some specificity of response. But you can see here, they couldn't confirm it, that they, it had anything to do with the hawk shade. That doesn't mean that later on it doesn't. Because they can habituate to other shapes and they, and not to the, uh, the hawk if their experience is teaching them something else. But it's interesting how nonspecific some of these fixed action, the key stimuli can be. They're very, very simple. What we see is the hawk. What they see is just something up there that's about the size of a hawk and moving in a certain way. Okay. Do humans show maladaptive responses to key stimuli too? They certainly do. We eat too much sugar, we eat high fat foods because it tastes better. And the restaurants always add extra sugar and fat. Restaurants are a horror, horror for diabetics. I've learned that. I always have trouble with my blood sugar after eating at a restaurant. So I choose my restaurants very, very carefully and generally won't go to them at all. What about other things? I picked this quote from the internet that I found this just, a couple, uh, just last year. Like all animals, humans have instincts, genetically hard, hardwired behaviors that enhance our ability to cope with vital environmental contingencies. Our innate fear of snakes is an example. Other instincts, including denial, revenge, tribal loyalty, greed, and our urge to procreate, now threaten our very existence. In other words, it's important we come to understand our own fixed action patterns. Let's talk about one more thing here. Lawrence's discussion of the transposability of key stimuli. All he means is that animals are responding not the exact size of the stimuli usually, doesn't matter, but it's the, if it's the configuration at all, this is unlike in those turkeys where the size and movement where it seemed to be critical. But in most cases, it's the relationship between stimuli, just like the relationship between sounds and a song. We recognize the song, even though the pitch may vary a lot and the loudness may vary a lot, we can still recognize it. Uh, and you can use dummy stimuli. I just drew some of these. Uh, most little birds res uh, nesting thrushes, they respond to any stimulus that's even remotely similar to a bird. <laughs> All it has to have is a, a top part that's about one-third the size of the bottom part, and they will show gaping. It's about all they, all they require. Seems very stupid what they're doing, but that's all that's required. And if you have two sticks like this, they're presented like this, they'll always respond to the upper one. If they're presented once much closer, then they will respond. If it's presented horizontally anyway, they'll respond to the uh, the nearer one. But if they're presented like this... Even though this is near, they'll still go for the upper one. Because it, it's just a matter of probabilities, what they're likely to encounter in that nest when they're feeding. And these simple stimulus properties have been exploited by other birds. Birds like the cuckoo that lay their nest in other birds' nests. Because those other birds respond to the egg. In fact, if it's a little larger, they might respond better to it. Often the eggs, depending on the, the uh, 
parasitic bird uh, resembles their egg. In the case of the cuckoo, it doesn't always. In the case of the whiter bird, the egg mimics their own, the egg of the species they're, they're fooling and getting to raise their young, and even their babies look like the other species for a while. Whiters are much more innocuous in that they don't destroy the other birds in the nest. But the cuckoo is horrible. You know, it puts its egg in there, and it hatches. At least one of those eggs won't even survive. The, the, the chick won't even survive. And in many cases, no other little birds will survive. Just the cuckoo. So why do they do it? Lauren says they're, it's their vice. They, they can't, you know, a vice is <laughs> you're following an instinct that's bad for you. He says a vice of these birds is they, they respond to the gaping response of these. Look at, look at the gape here of the cuckoo. Here's this enormous chick with this huge gape, and there's the reed warbler feeding him. That's his vice. He can't resist. Okay, so think about why they, why don't the birds evolve some way to avoid this being taken advantage of and having their own reproduction go down? Because another bird is, they're raising other birds' chicks. We'll talk about that next time. 